Amen. Amen. Yeah. We, uh, we used to have this house, well, it's, it's, um, we used to have this house, we used to have this, near my house, there was a road, and it was this really steep hill, and a hill over here, and a long hill, and we used to go pretty fast, sorry, Kale, uh, we'd go pretty fast down this hill, and then when we get to the bottom, we shift into neutral, and see how far we can make it up this hill, you know, so there was like markers along the way of however far we can make it up, and uh, we never could make it all the way to the top of that hill. Eventually, your car slows down, and uh, if you aren't careful, you're, you, you just try to go to the, it'll start going backwards, obviously. At some point, you, uh, you, the coast turns into a drift backwards, and I, you know, was, as Nate was talking, I was thinking about that. We, we get, we're pumped for God. We're going downhill, and our, and our gas pedal's floored. You know what I'm talking about? Those moments in God, you're like, wow, like this, this is just awesome, right? And you are just flooring it down a hill, and then you start heading up the hill, and Maybe you take your foot off the gas, you, you put it into neutral, kind of coasting. You still got some momentum you're carrying into life, but at some point, that momentum will end. And then it's like, well, what next? And I got, there's great news. Just put it into first. You know what I'm saying? Just put it back into first. As it says in Revelation, you know, go back and do the things you did at first. Put it into first, downshift a second, and, well, that's, you know, boy, I miss a clutch, right? And I'm down top. Now I'm thinking of clutches, and I missed that. Wish we had more cars like that around here. Um, if anybody has one, I'd love to drive it, so let me know, and we'll, uh, that'll be fun. Anyhow, um, avoid, avoid the drift, the coast. And I think that as we dive into Judges today, uh, we, uh, we'll see more of it. But today I want to just fix our eyes on some, some real heroes here that we're going to look at today. And, um, and some, perhaps some, some application for us in their story that will help us uh, in our lives. Give us, A, courage, strength, vitality, hope, and... Uh, in a, in a sense of, um, of real war against sin in our own life. So today, if you have your, if you're, have your Bibles, I don't have the scriptures up here because, frankly, I'm going to read too much. Uh, it's Judges chapter 4. Um, uh, Judges chapter 4 today. And we're just going to read through the story today of Deborah and Barak and Jael. And so uh, we're going to read through this story today. If you're familiar with it, it'll be familiar. If you're not familiar with it, listen in, sit back. It's an amazing story of God's deliverance in Judges chapter 4. And the people of Israel, verse 1, again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. Ehud was a judge. Remember what I talked about last week? God raises up judges. People serve the Lord in the seasons of the judges. And their drift happens when judges die. You'll see that through the, through the book of Judges. So Ehud's a judge. He dies. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Haresh Hagoyim. That's, you're welcome. I, I, you can write that down. I, I'm, I just say it confidently. Then the people in Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you'll go with me, I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zananimim, which is near Kadesh. Now, by the way, just so you know, this guy Heber, you're like, who is this guy? What is he here part of the story? It's kind of a parenthesis because at the end of this passage, we're going to read about Heber's wife, Jael. So they're just letting you know the, 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 the players in the story and where they are. Heber lives in this general area where they're headed. So when Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him, from Haroshes Hagoyim to the river Kishon. 
And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord, Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the armies to Herosheth, Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the opening of the tent. If any man comes and asks you, is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him, and she drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to, to meet him and said to him, come and I'll show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with a tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel, and the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. I'm going to pause there. Um, I, we could read on to the song of Deborah and Barak. Uh, I'm going to reference some of the song in a minute, because some of it describes the battle uh, that just happened. Um, but here we have this kind of crazy story. You know, really we have... Uh, you know, five major players in the story, actually three major players with, or four major players with one kind of uh, uh, tiny player. Uh, but we have Deborah. She's known as the prophetess judge. We'll talk about all these characters here in a few minutes. Deborah, the prophetess judge. We have Barak, who I'll define as the warrior judge. He too was a leader there. He, was the, he wore that warrior mantle, the warrior deliverer that we talked about last week. That was the... Uh, the, the, the mantle that, that uh, Barak wore, the warrior deliverer, the warrior judge. We have Jael, really the heroine of our story. Really a, a real hero here uh, with a real kind of a gruesome scene, uh, but quite the heroic scene. We have Jabin, who's king of Canaan. Uh, we ref he's referenced along with Heber, Jael's husband. Um, you know, we have a, a couple players that are out there, but really the main commander that we, we study or we look at is a man by the name of Sisera. And he was commander of Jabin's army. And uh, we'll, look at, we'll look ahead in the song of Deborah. But this man was an absolute wicked man. A wicked, wicked man. You know, sometimes you read through that story of, of Jael and you think to yourself, boy, she kind of like got this guy in her tent. She let him go to sleep and she killed him. What kind of like, where's the, what's that about? Well, we're going to see how not only was that a, um, you know, it was a necessary judgment on the wickedness of the nations. And we're going to look at that today uh, in the scripture. But let's start with Deborah. Let's start with Deborah. What, a, uh, what an amazing woman of God. An absolute amazing woman of God. Deborah, we, uh, uh, I define her as the unexpected judge. Kind of unexpected. Out of this Ehud and Shamgar and Othniel, the judges that come in, and we read about more Gideon and, and you know, Jephthah and Samson. And in the middle of it, we have this woman, this prophetess judge. Who was she? Well, the Bible says she was the wife, wife of Lapidoth. Again, if, one thing is we read through the book of Judges. This is helpful. If anybody's looking to have uh, names for babies, that one's unused. Lapidoth, uh, that would be one you could use to name your child with. I definitely throw it out there. It's open, it's open season on that name, so you could use that. Uh, we have some Debbies in the room, so uh, Debbies are already taken. Is your name Deborah? It, what is it? Debbie. It's just Debbie. Oh, cool. That's neat. Cool, cool. All right. So, uh, um, but we have, we have, we have uh, uh, Deborah, wife of Lapidoth. And we really learn nothing else about Lapidoth, uh, nothing else about him at all, just that he's the husband of uh, Deborah. But we learn that Def Deborah there, she's a prophetess who is judging uh, the people of uh, the people there. And it says that she's judging them under the palm of Deborah. Very important to understand even the, uh, what, what a tree would mean. It's like, is that a special place? Is that a good place? Like the palm of Deborah. Well, certainly it was a tree that was known to people. You need to go get judged. You, that situation needs to go, you need to go bring that to Deborah. She's up under the palm of Deborah, this, the, the, this tree that existed. Now, 
What's interesting is the tree, if you study out through Scripture, the Bible says cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. The tree, and, and that deals with the, de- the, desec- the desecration of a dead body that would happen in those days. and in those, That's why in the, in, the, in the Old Testament it says don't let a tree hang past sundown. Uh, uh, don't let a body hang on a tree past sundown. Take it down um, and you know, cover it with rocks. There's different things they do with dead bodies. But you know, that, in that day and age, the tree was the place of capital punishment. That was the, that was the, it was the highest form of punishment, the highest form of, uh, of punishment. That's why Jesus was actually crucified on a tree. The Bible says, cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. And Jesus breaks the curse for us. He became death for us. And so you can see all these type of uh, things that happen there. But here we have Deborah under the palm of Deborah. And her placement under that tree is really an example to us of a high and esteemed place of judge. It wasn't like she was like, just go find a place, Deborah, and, uh, you know, and, and go judge Israel. No, it was actually quite a respected place that she was and where she was. But understand this, it is truly out of, the pla- out of place for a woman to suddenly appear in the Old Testament, in the middle of the Old Testament, in the story of Judges, as a judge. It's unexpected. It's not, it's not, a, it's not the, the normal pattern here. Again, I believe it's in, in such a beautiful way. It's God's way of showing, we'll talk about this, how he takes the weak things of the world to shame the wise. He does it all through the book of Judges. Where, you know, the previous judge we just read about, if you read, if you're at chapter 4 and you look at the verse, last verse of chapter 3, it talks about a guy named Shamgar. And it says, uh, Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad. And he also ser- saved Israel. An ox goad is like a shepherd's tool with a little, little point on the end. It's like this, this tool that you'd use to, to take care of oxen or, 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 or sheep. And, and here's this, this guy, Shamgar, uses it to rout 600 Philistines with this thing. It's not the weapon of choice. Later on, we'll read about Samson uses the jawbone of a donkey. David will read about, in, in, in Samuel, we'll read David takes a slingshot and five smooth stones. Moses himself was a, was, he said, I'm a weak man with weak speech. And he carried around a shepherd's staff. But that's what he carried. It became the staff of God. So God, through this whole story, through this whole season of time, through Moses and then into the judges and into David, it's God's way of taking the weak things, the things that aren't, um, aren't the super powerful, and showing his glory through it, demonstrating his glory through it. A little dive that, that uh, we don't have time to look at at all, but a little dive into the comparison of the story of Deborah and the story of Moses is actually pretty amazing. Like even, the, even the, the correlation and it's something that you can study on your own, you can certainly look into it. But remember, these judges, as we see them, they're really seen as second Moses figures. They're seen as deliverers. They're seen, remember, the people of Israel are caught in slavery, right? They're in slavery in Egypt. Moses comes and delivers them and brings them out of slavery. Where do we have the people in this story? Sold into slavery. They're in slavery, uh, kept into slavery, and God begins to send uh, Deborah there. She was known as a prophetess. Moses was a prophet of God. We can look at the story where Sisera arrives with 900 chariots of iron. Does anybody ever remember where another part in Scripture where we have chariots arriving? 600 of them, actually. The story of Moses. And where was he? At the Red Sea. Here we have the story of Sisera at the, at the river Kishon. Here we have the Red Sea and, uh, and Pharaoh and his, and his army there. We read in Judges 5.21. I don't believe I have this Scripture up here. But in Judges 5, in the Song of Deborah, she recounts the deliverance that happens here uh, at the time. And she says this. She says, the torrent Kishon swept them away. I'll start in verse 20. It says, from heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. And then it says, the torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. Speaking of a, a deliverance even of water, of some miraculous of, uh, deluge of water that happens from the sky, from the river, that actually was part of this story that happens here in the deliverance. Again, we look back to the story of Moses and we see uh, the great deliverance of the people from the chariots. It was the Red Sea that was miraculously parted and then it came in and it swallowed up the people. And then what's really interesting, the story of Moses, you remember they have that great Red Sea deliverance. The chariots are, are defeated. They come to the other side and what does Moses do? Moses sings a song. 
It's called the Song of Moses. He sings a song, and he doesn't just sing it alone, actually. Somebody else joins him. His sister Miriam joins him. So we have, we have a song that's sung by Moses and Miriam, this kind of uh, song of, of celebration. Right after this deliverance against Sisera and his army, what do we have? We have Deborah and Barak sitting, sitting there singing this beautiful song that, is, that, that is certainly becomes a song for the people. Again, it's an amazing connection that I promise you was not lost on the people of that day. The people living in that moment, they saw the connection. God is on the move. God is delivering us, even in our brokenness, even from our oppression, even from the failure that we fell into oppression. God is pulling us out of our own drift that we found ourselves in. God is redeeming us. God is bringing us out. And ultimately, all these judges, all these deliverances, all these things, they're, lo they're looking ahead to the ultimate king, the ultimate warrior deliverer that would deliver them forever. That was weird. I wasn't trying to point to that, but that was good. That was nice, Ben. Yeah. Needing a Savior. That's what they're pointing towards. We need a Savior. A Savior that will not die. Because Deborah would die. Barak would die. These people, Ehud, died. You know, that's what happens. And then they're left to their own devices, and the people of Israel spiraled out. You know what? You've got to do a favor for me. Go back into the office. Um, on the, on the, somewhere in there, there is a, there is a stack of papers that, I'm sorry, this is, uh, I was supposed to have this to you before the service, and I forgot again. Stack of papers. It's a drawing. It's kind of like an artistic drawing of the book of, uh, of, of, the book of Judges. Some of you already got it, but uh, I wanted to make sure everybody had one. Yeah, Esther drew it. No, just get it, and I'll give it to everybody before we leave. Thanks. Um, again, so the judges die, and then what we have is we have a spiraling out of control again of the people. A continued downward drift, and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. Why? Because the people, they were living amongst the wicked people, embracing a wicked, wicked things. Well, the next person we meet, though, in this story is, so we meet Deborah, this, this great prophet, this judge. But then we meet this guy, Barak, who really is an amazing warrior judge. The one whom God uses to rout Sisera's army. The one who's used there to, in a miraculous, supernatural, amazing way. Who doesn't ultimately get the glory of it all. But you know what he gets? He gets mentioned in the, Hebrew, in, in the hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, I have this scripture here, Hebrews chapter 11. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, there he is. Here's this guy. We just read this story about this guy. You've just read his account, and that account now makes it into the book of Hebrews as an account of mighty faith. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness. There we have it. Strong out of weakness. All through, we see it all through, the, all through the book of Judges, right in the midst of it all. Became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. I love how scripture describes him as a man of faith. Barak. Man of faith. It's beautiful. But what do we see from Barak? We're reading the same scripture. We're seeing what he did. Let's see what it says. In, in, uh, in uh, Judges chapter 4, it says here, Benny, you throw that next scripture up there? I think I have it. Yeah, uh, right there. Barak goes to Deborah. So this Deborah says, hey, go. Deborah's, got a, Deborah's a prophetess. She knows what's happening. She knows the strategy of the Lord. Just keep them there. We'll hand them out. She knows the strategy of the Lord, what, the, what God wants to do. And so she says, Barak, you need to go. Barak, you know the Lord told you this is time to go. You know, we need people around us to kind of light a little fire under us, right? To say it's time to go. Sometimes husbands, you come home and your wife says, you know what you need to do. You know what needs to happen. See, I can't hear the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Lord just puts our wives in our lives to tell us what the Lord's saying. And vice versa, by the way. But we won't get into that. I don't want to speak. I don't want to get totally into that. Listen to what Barak says. He says, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. I want to just point out for a second. What an absolute statement of faith that is. It was Barak and 10,000 men. Standing there. You can just picture all the men just worn up there, you know. Here we go. Barak says, I ain't going unless the woman goes with me. If you go, then we have victory. If the woman doesn't come, ain't no chance. That's, that's what he said. That's exactly what Barak said. What is he saying? He's making a statement of faith. He sees something. 
What's interesting is Moses made a very similar declaration. Moses said, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Talking to God, Lord, we will not go unless you go with me. What is Barak saying? I want what's in you. I want what God's put in you. I want that. Now, just like it happens to all of us, like many of us, we put our faith in the right direction, but sometimes it falls on the wrong object. We're putting our faith, we're, we're fixed in the right direction, but sometimes we, we put our faith in the chariots. We put our faith in the horses. We put our faith in the stuff. When the stuff is just there because God miraculously provided it anyways. It's very easy to, to, to miss God because of the objects around us. I want us to make sure that we're constantly living our, lifting our eyes up. Barak was seen as a man of faith there. And he certainly walked out as a man of faith. He stepped out in situations at the word of the Lord. uh, He stepped out and led them to a mighty rout of the army. I mean, it led to a point where everybody, they couldn't even ride their chariots anymore. They had to abandon their chariots, probably because of of what was happening there in in, in the water and the ground. Who knows, right? But here they are jumping. It says abandons his chariot. (laughs) For those who know, it's easier to run and get away from people on a chariot than it is on foot. But he abandons his chariot. He runs, he gets out of there. There's a tremendous victory. The army is routed, but the ultimate defeat of Sisera, as it was spoken there by Deborah, it will be at the hand of a woman. Why? Again, because it's this idea that it is out of, that God chooses the weak things. God chooses those things to shame the wise. Now don't, you know, well, we're not all weak. Listen, here's the the reality. The Bible says the, the women are the weaker vessel. That's what the Bible says. God's showing his glory here. Why does, when Gideon, we'll talk about this, get ahead of myself, but why, why when God, Gideon has 30,000 guys, God says, too much. Let's, uh, let's, let, let's whittle it down a little bit. That's yeah, still too many. Let's get it down. Okay, 300 now, 300. Okay, we can work with 300 people. Why? Because he doesn't want us to take the glory. He doesn't want us to be about us. He doesn't want it to be about us. So we have Sisera, Sisera, we, we, the next guy, and Again, take a moment to talk about Jabin, Sisera, Canaan. Jabin was a descendant of Hazor, a king that actually we see defeated. He was defeated in Joshua's day. But here we have the kingdom rise back up. We have this never fully dealt with. And we have this commander of this army, a guy by the name of Sisera, commander of his army. And we're going to read in a little bit how, how what a wicked, wicked, wicked man this was. Absolute wicked people. And that God sent Deborah... God sent Barak, and ultimately through the hand of Jael, God sent all of them to deliver the people of Israel and to bring justice to wickedness. That's what we see here. It's exactly what God does here. So here we meet Jael. Interesting about Jael, she wasn't an Israelite. She's not even from the people of Israel. She's not even, again, she's, she's pulled out of obscurity, kind of like another person we learn about in the story of Joshua, one by the name of Rahab who was used, uh, pulled again out of obscurity into a place of being used by God to see deliverance happen. So her jail comes, comes out, God uses her in a re- profound way. She's part of a nomadic people, a people that, that travel. They, they, would, they would live in tents, they, they'd uproot their tents, and they'd, they'd live in other places. And still, you can still see that even in the Middle East today, there are people that are nomadic people. They, they, they live and they, 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 they move around. Um, they moved often. We read in the middle of uh, chapter 4 that Heber, uh, Jael's husband, had pitched his tent near Kadesh. And that's where they were. So they're right near this whole army thing happening. They're right near this whole uh, thing happening. So Jael meets Sisera after they were routed in battle by the waters of the Kishon and the army of Barak. And what does she do? She invites him into her tent. Now, understand this. Jael's husband was not home. He wasn't there. She calls to Sisera to turn aside to her, to come with her into her home. Now, here's the reality. We must understand this. Sisera was absolutely planning to ravage, to pillage homes, and to rape women. That is exactly what was going to happen. Sorry for the, to be over the top, but this is the book of Judges, and we got to say what it is. It is what it is. It was an expected part of of the wickedness of the people of the land. I mean, they expected this. This is like their their greatest hero. And Deborah actually sings about this in her song. So if you have have your books of Judges chapter 5, Judges chapter 5, Deborah sings about 
Sisera's mother. So Sisera, this commander of the army, this, this commander of the army of Canaan, right? We have, we have Deborah's referencing his mother sitting back in the land looking for Sisera to come home. When is Sisera to come home? So listen to what she says. I think we have this here. Out of the window, she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Next scripture. Her wisest princesses answer. Indeed, she answers herself. Now I want to pause there for a second. It's not just the princesses. It's not just her that's saying this. It's the princesses themselves. Everybody knows this about Sisera. Everybody knows how Sisera lives his life. Everybody knows how Sisera lives his world. Everybody knows about him. Listen to what she says about Sisera. Her wisest princesses answer. Indeed, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? Like, haven't they already pillaged and gotten what we needed? Haven't they already gotten all this stuff? And then listen, a womb or two for every man. Listen to what that's saying. Listen to the description of the expectation of his mother. Like, where isn't Sisera? Hasn't he already found a couple women to pillage there? Hasn't he already? Not just that. It's, it's in such a way, a womb or two, the language there, it, it's used just to describe an object of, 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 of just wicked. It's wicked, guys. It's wickedness that these people lived under. A womb or two for every man, spoil of dyed materials for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. That was the, that was, the, the, this is the people that the nation of Israel is drifting towards. This is who they're becoming like. This is who's influencing them. This is who's discipling them. This is who's leading them. And without, without deliverers, God actually sells them back into slavery and says, well, here we go. This is what you want with your wickedness. This is what's coming your way. That was the modus, the M.O. of Sisera was to rape and pillage. Maybe Jael knew that. Maybe, I don't know if Jael had, they say there, there was like history between Heber and Jabin the king. So perhaps Jael knew this guy. She, you know, his reputation went before. I mean, she clearly knew who he was on some level. But she calls him into her tent. And she, God uses her in that time to bring judgment to wickedness. That's what God does. God judges wickedness. That's what he does. And that's what he will do. God judges it. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. God judges sin. And the downward spiral of the people is a people who have embraced the absolute moral depravity of the world around them. Jael brings Sisera into her tent. He asks for water. She gives him milk. He lays down to rest. And what does she do? She grabs a tent peg and a hammer and she drives it through his temple. By the way, that was, her, that was the nomadic people the women are the one who actually set up the tents. They were the ones who, so her, her use of the tent peg and the hammer, she was pretty adept at how to use that. She knew what she was doing. Quite familiar with it. So quite the story. <laughs> it's like, okay, quite the, it's quite this. Judges is, you're going to read this as we study through the book of Judges. This is like some stuff is like, okay, God, what are you trying to say here? What's, what's the big takeaway? I'm sure there's a lot of applications we could draw, draw, uh, draw from this story. I want to give you three today. Just three applications for us of what, what, what it can mean for us. Number one, that God chooses the weak things to shame the wise. We see this through when, um, what was it, was it Nathaniel? And, uh, you know, they, they said, uh, hey, you got to come see this guy from Nazareth. He's amazing. And what does Nathaniel say? He said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Right, this little podunk village? God raises up a young lady named Mary, you know? That she's going to be the one to carry the Savior of the world in. This little, the, 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 this teenage girl. You know, like in the middle of like all this. Yeah, from obscurity because it's not about us, guys. It's not about me or you. It's not about how strong we are, how, how capable we are. The reality is we're, we're broken people. But God takes the brokenness and he uses it in supernatural awesome ways. Deborah, Barak, Jael. God, God, God absolutely routes Sisera in an, amazing, in an amazing, glorious situation to show that this power is not from man but from me. David and his slingshot. Paul, when he preaches, Paul said, hey, when I came with you, I didn't come with wise and persuasive words, right? Paul said, I came with what? A demonstration of the power of God, of the Spirit's power. That's what we're longing for, amen? The Spirit's power. The use of inferior weapons 
is to show that this is all God and not us. I mentioned these, ox go, jawbone, Moses' staff, you know, different things, the, the, the slingshot. So in your weakness, in your weakness, every one of us, I guarantee that we've all stood in the mirror of our own lives and said, I'm weak, man. I'm weak. I'm weak. Dare to be weak, church. Because when we're weak, then he's strong. Dare to be weak. Dare to be like, I'm insignificant. Dare to be insignificant. Dare to feel like I have no place here. Dare to be in a place where you're just in a service and, a, and, 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 and washing feet. Dare to be like Jesus who, who washed the feet of his disciples. The guy who's going to lay his life down, including Judas there, washing his feet, weeping on them. Dare to be weak because it's in your weakness where he demonstrates his strength. Man. I don't know about you, Nathan, I appreciate you sharing because I think sometimes you, you just said kind of like what I was talking about is you put on your own shoulders the weight of, ah, I can buck up, figure this out, figure this out. Guys, you, it's, that will not last. It will not last. And then when you fall into weakness, then you're going to feel like a failure. And I'm a failure because I was, no, listen, when you fall into weakness, say, finally, I made it to the place you want me to be. Lord, have your way in my life. Don't beat yourself. Don't think now you have to fix yourself by being a strong failure. You know what I mean? Like, okay, i got to really show God what a failure I am now and so that he'll really accept me. No, just be weak. Just be like, God, I don't, I, 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 here I am. That's all I got. Watch what God does with that. Watch how God breathes in that. I was thinking of the song, I don't know who sang it. Was it Michael Card? I, don't, I can't remember who sang it. It's an old song. But uh, it goes, uh, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Sounds like a song in the 70s, because it was. Uh, so uh, it was a song that was dealing with this thing of, man, you, you walk through life, and there's people that affect you and, and, trans and, and have, an, have an impact in your life and transformation, and it won't be till heaven that you can be able to say to them, thank you. I think of my, my, my dentist's wife. My dentist's wife, I, grew, I got saved at their house at a vacation Bible school that she had at her house. I remember the day. I don't know her. I can't wait to heaven. I could say, thank you. Thank you for pouring into my life. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for because it's you, where you were weak, God was strong. And that brings us to the, the second big takeaway, the second big application. Live a life that says, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. A horse prepares for battle, but victory belongs, God bless you, but victory belongs to the Lord. Victory belongs to the Lord. That's who victory belongs to. I love how um, the scripture we sang about God's the overcomer. And the Bible does say we are more than conquerors through, through Christ Jesus. And it talks about us being overcomers to you who overcome in Revelation. But it says in John, it's talking about Jesus. It says, um, in this world you'll have much trouble. But take heart, Jesus said. I've overcome the world. <laughs> it's like, e well, yeah. You've overcome it, but I'm still here in it. And he's like, yeah, you don't get it. I've overcome the world. I, I'm everything you need. I'm everything you need. It's all my glory. It's all for my, I'm, I'm bigger than it all, man. I got it all. All through the book of Judges, God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Because at the end of it, at the end of it all, when the Savior comes, it's God himself that will come and save the, save the world. Don't let your life be marred by the desire to take the glory for God's victory or even blame it on the defeats and live in the defeats either. It is what it is. There's times where you go, you know, I stubbed my toe. You know, I stubbed my toe today. Oh, man, you know, don't let that ruin. Hey, Lord, teach me today. You know, show me something today about, the, number one, heal my toe. It would be great if it felt better. But, Lord, if I have to walk with a little bit of a limp today, let me walk slow. Show me something today, Lord. Lead me and guide me. I remember uh, today's, the, today's the world championships are going on right now of, uh, of wrestling, freestyle wrestling. So, you know, uh, Vic Giselle and I this morning, we were having breakfast over at the hometown, and we, uh, we sat and watched, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if she wanted to watch it, but uh, it was quality time for us to watch a wrestling match uh, from, from Norway. I don't even know where the match is right now. I think it's in Norway. It's like 7 o'clock this morning. We're watching this guy named Jordan Burroughs uh, wrestle, and uh, it's a great match. Anyhow, a couple years ago, there was a guy uh, named uh, uh, Kyle Snyder. Big, you know, big American, one of our one of our American uh, best wrestlers, Kyle uh, lost to this this guy, got beat by this guy, and after the match they said, "Hey, you lost to this guy. What is that? You know, what is that? Uh, what is that? How does that define you? And you know, how does that, how does this loss define you?" And he goes, 
this loss doesn't define me. He goes, if I won, that doesn't define me either. I'm defined by what Jesus Christ did for me when he gave his life for me. That's what defines me. Church, we cannot define ourselves by wins or losses, by how much money is in our checkbook, by, by what kind of car we drive, or what kind of job we have, or this thing. That doesn't define us. What we're, defines us is who we are in Christ by his, by his glory. He makes us in transforming us ever in, into his ever-increasing glory. There's something good happening here. Let it happen. Let God grow that. To God be the glory. Finally, and I'll wrap up with this, the third thing, and I take this out of the life of JL, and it's this. Brutally deal with the sin in your tent. Brutally deal with the sin in your tent. Not somebody else's tent, your tent. Man, how did this sin get here? How did the commander of the army here get in my tent? Well, you know what? It's there. Deal with it. And deal with it brutally. Put it to death. The problem is not the temptation. It's what you do with it, and that's how you respond. I heard this, Martin Luther said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. You can't keep the birds from flying over your head. Temptations are going to come, but you can, you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Be in an all-out war against the sin in your life. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's what the Bible says. Bible says, flee sexual immorality. Bible says in Hebrews, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race set before us. A little farther in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He did. Matthew, Jesus said in the, in, uh, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into he- than go into hell. Uh, by the way, um, I don't believe in a physical cutting off of hands. So it's less, less you, okay, wait a second. So is he saying I should drive a stake through my hand today? I'm mis- misunderstanding the message. No, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about getting serious with it. Getting serious with your sin. Getting serious with, with that stuff. Uh, God said this to Cain. He said to Cain, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. That is such a powerful statement. Sin's desire is contrary to you. Contrary. It's against you. So you gotta, you got to fight against it. War against it. The Bible says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So again, the application gets serious about your sin. Fight it. Reign it in. Rule over your flesh. Fight against the temptation that have come to rule over you. We could talk about different temptations. Maybe you have a temptation of, of, uh, of, of maybe, you, maybe you're gambling, and, you're, and you're just, you just can't help it. You just can't. You just, you just get into it. I, I one time, one time, one, um, I, uh, probably about 15 years ago, somebody uh, had me bet some money on, it was like five bucks on, a, on a, the beginning of the Super Bowl run, like a, on a team. So I was like, yeah, I'll throw five bucks in there. Sure, that's fine. Well, then my money, it started the team that I bet on, which sounds terrible. I bet on a team, but it is what it is, like five bucks. But here we go. But the team that, that, that I bet, they started winning. They started winning. They made it all the way to the Super Bowl. They made it all the way to the Super Bowl. You're like, who was it? Yeah, you ever notice, who was it? Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it was the Cardinals. And uh, the, uh, anyways, so uh, this almost made 10 years ago. But the, I don't remember when it was. No, it was, it was longer than that. Uh, the, uh, the Steelers, the Cardinals Steelers, whatever year that was. Uh, what's that? No, it won't. Because I remember watching the game, and I was like, come on! I was like so over intense about two teams. I, I mean, I love football, but this was, it was in my soul. It was in like something was in my soul about this. And I remember, and my team lost, and I was like, thank God they lost. I mean, I like, by the end, it was like hundreds of dollars I would have won. And I was like losing, my, losing myself over this thing. It became, I said, I can never touch that again. Ever. Ever. Ben, no way. I did. I repented of it, dropped it, never touched it again, never went back to it again. But maybe you struggle with that. Well, guess what? Delete the internet site that you're going on. You know, take away your card. Have somebody else, keep, find somebody to be accountable with. Say, man, I got a problem. I have, I have to, this is an issue of my life. Deal with it. Get serious about it. 
If you struggle with, you know, a lot, some, a lot of men struggle with uh, pornography. I say a lot of men. A lot of the men in the world do. I would hope that we're finding victory here in the church. But the reality is, stats say there are men here in this room right here that, are, that, that struggle with that. Pornography. And women. Well, there's ways that you can fight against it. There are, there are even, like, things you can join and pay money for that, will, that, somebody, that every website you, you visit, somebody gets an email on. That, 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 that way you could say, I want to get serious about it. Because it's impossible for some of us to avoid, you know, unless we go live out in the woods, you know, like to, to even avoid the internet world. That's it. Because, so you, you find ways, I'm, I want to I wanna fight hard with this thing. I want to deal with this thing. But you know your sin, but you got to say it's in your camp. What did Jael do? She grabbed the tent peg and said, I'm killing this thing right here. I'm ju- this thing is no longer, not leaving my tent anymore. I'm done with it. We got to get serious about our sin. That, that, and, that, and, that, and that's in us. Fight against it. The great war we're all in is the fight in our souls. And we must get at it. I want to read a scripture. I, this scripture was on my heart as I was just sharing. Uh, and um, I have to look at it because I'm Isaiah chapter 54. Because I think there's something here that the Lord wants to grow us in. Isaiah chapter 54 says this. It says, sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of who, her who is married. We just basically have, again, the weakness, the weakness, somebody's weakness in their life. And then it says this, enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out broad to the right and to the left. And your offspring will possess the nations and, the, and will people the desolate cities. I feel like part of us dealing with sin, even in this imagery that we have a jail with a tent peg, part of dealing with sin is the enlargement of our tents. If we don't deal with that sin, we become very small, we become very internal and very here, but we begin dealing with things, the Lord grows us by his glory, by his strength. In the end of that passage, Isaiah chapter 54, it says this, no weapon formed against you shall succeed. You shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. The Siseras in the world have no hold on you. Don't follow, don't follow Canaan. Stand up with the Lord who's delivered them into your hands. Let's stand to our feet today. Thank you, Lord. God chooses the weak things to shame the wise and to shame the strong. To God be the glory through it all and all. And God, give us strength to deal with the sin in our tent. That you could deal with that and remove it from our life. Amen. I'm sure all of us are like, Lord, deal with that. Lord, deal with that. Just recently, I was in a situation just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I try to live vulnerably before you guys. I was in a situation just recently where I suddenly realized, oh, I think I have bitterness in my heart towards somebody. Towards some situation. It was, it was like, I didn't know it was there. I, pr- I promise you. I didn't know. All of a sudden it was like, ugh, where did that come from? You know what I did? Repented right there. Lord, I'm, I'm in the wrong here. I'm, something's going on in my soul. You got to heal me. That's not the heart of the Lord. That's not the heart of Jesus. That's something in my tent. God, help me. Help us. Strengthen us. Lead us. So, Father, today I thank you so much for the body of Christ. I thank you for those that are standing here before you today. Lord, I pray that, Lord, if there be anybody here, Lord, today that does not know you or they're dealing with a sin and they don't know how to get rid of it, Lord, I pray today you'd give them supernatural strength to see that thing defeated and and eradicated from their life. Father, strengthen them, lead them, help them, grow them, and, uh, Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit today, I pray, uh, and strengthen them in, 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 in profound ways. Lord, where we're weak, be strong today. Uh, Lord, where we're, uh, uh, where we're in need today, Lord, be exactly what we need. Lord, you are our shepherd. We shall not want. Lead us, guide us, transform us, we pray. And Lord, I pray for all the small groups that are happening and all the studies. Lord, um, let that be a, uh, a, uh, a blessing for the body. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to, to grab those sheets and take them out by the door and just hand them to people as they go out. The judges' sheets. The judges' sheets. Just, just, just give them to people. You guys can just go back to the doors. Grab one of those sheets from the girls before you leave. It's basically Esther Brown drew it. It's a really nice little drawing of, uh, of the, go ahead and give one to people on the way by. But it's a nice little drawing of the book of Judges. It'll help you understand it as we continue to walk through it. God bless you guys. So great to see everybody today. May you go in the grace and the peace of the Lord.